Hi, everyone. Welcome to a leader seminar. This is How Close to the Cliff Are You When Your Eyes Are Closed? I'm Cindy Zulsdorf, and I'm here with special guest Philip Adams. He's the founder and CEO of Fabrics. Also, Kevin Salvage, the sales engineering and technical marketing manager at Leader Europe, and Stephen Holmes, the solutions architect at Leader. If you're interested in the SDI physical layer measurement and eye pattern, this is for you. Today, you're going to find out what to look for in order to prevent falling off the digital cliff, the best stress tool sets for eye and jitter, and bring all your questions because we're doing Q&A full on. Over to you, Kevin. Cindy, thank you very much. So before Steve and I hand the floor over to Phil, we're all familiar with the picture, waveform, vector scope, histogram, diamond pattern displays. But these tools are used to measure and analyze the quality of the image, known as quality of experience or QOE. But what about quality of service? So quality of service is a term we've used for the mechanism or technology that work on a network to control traffic to ensure the performance of critical applications take place in these networks. Now, in the days of analog signals, quality of service and quality of experience were inextricably linked. If one degraded, then the other was affected. But with the digital signals, that's not the case. And now the two are separated. But by the time we get to IP, they're divorced, living on a separate continent and fighting over the children. But that's another session for another day. So before we get too deep into this fascinating subject, Steve, can you give our audience a brief and entry level introduction to QoS with video and the eye pattern? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So we've, you know, in the analog days, QoS and QoE were really intertwined because if the facility started getting noisy, the video got noisy. And in today's world with digital, they are pretty well separated. You could have a perfect picture and your facility could be just barely off the floor. So one of the things we are hoping this seminar will help you with is the separation of that. How do we look at QOE versus QoS? Uh, we're all familiar with QoS being looking at the picture, looking at how clear the picture is. Is it blurry? Is it blocked out? Is it in focus? But QoS now is going to talk about what is the quality of the transmission path, i.e. our serial digital, our SDI path. So when we look at things in the SDI side, it starts getting into packet loss, bit rate, throughput, transmission delay, and of course, jitter. And those are the things that Phil is going to take and expand upon. But I just want to take one quick minute and look at a piece of this just to kind of give you a quick introduction to how an eye pattern is actually created. What is an eye pattern? We, we look at it, but a lot of us don't understand actually what it is. So if we look at this, when we see an eye pattern, what it is is a series of the information overlaid on top of one another. It's very much like, if you will, if you're looking at a waveform, you're looking at all 1,080 lines right on top of one another. It's the whole reason we have line select, so that we can do a delay B equivalent on an oscilloscope and be able to take a snapshot of just one line, but we still need to do it at the sweep rate. So in looking at an eye pattern, if you look here, if I've got a high, a low, a low, and another high, the next instant in time, I may have a low, a high, a low, a low going out. I may have a low, low, high, high going out. The next instant in time may be a, 
a high, high, low, high coming out. And the next instant in time, <clears throat> maybe looking at the high, high, low. And what have we done? We have built our eye pattern. So in looking at this, that's how the eye pattern is actually created. It's all of the data happening so fast that it's overlaid on top of one another. And the eye is this little circular area inside of here is what we actually call the eye and how clean that is. Jitter gets into looking at what happens when this eye starts to close and the crossover point starts getting really wide and what's happening here. And what actually creates jitter is looking at, if we look at it in slow-mo, is all of the pulses moving and actually jittering just, but it's happening so fast that it looks like a big blur when we're all done. So those are the pieces and looking at the standards like this shot out of the standard of how an eye is created and what it's going to look like. And this is where I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Phil and let him take over and woo us with how we deal with this. So how do we measure an eye in what does an eye do for us, Phil? So, yep. Yeah. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whoever you are, wherever you are. Uh, it's great to be presenting today uh, in conjunction with Kevin and Steve and supported by Cindy. Um, I'm here to talk about eye and jitter testing, et cetera. Uh, we'll cover quite a few aspects of that. Um, I've had quite a lot of experience with this. I've been test. I'm a design engineer by, um, by training. I've been in the broadcast industry for about 40 years, and for about 37 of those years, I've been working with SDI, right from the beginnings of SDI uh, with the original Sony chipsets, uh, right through to the, to, to the latest chipsets now. So I've got a lot of experience. It's a very kind of complex subject. It, it can, be, can be very boring, uh, and it can be interesting. It depends on, on uh, what makes you tick. And I'm sure we have quite a varied audience on the call. So I'm sorry if it goes into too much depth in some areas, um, but please you know, answer questions. We can answer uh, questions at the end uh, to put people straight. So how close to the cliff are you when your eyes are closed? Uh, obviously there's a guy here about to slip on a banana. Um, you can make lots of mistakes uh, with respect to eye and jitter testing. And we get quite a lot of customers questions and some of them, are, you know, people are genuinely a little bit confused. So hopefully we'll bring a little bit of uh, clarity uh, to things. So it's all about symptom specifications initially um, and signal integrity. This is a little bit like Steve's uh, diagram. Um, we have the we have uh, the eye pattern itself. Uh, this is just looking at a, a, a single trace of it. Uh, but you're looking at the signal amplitude. You're looking at the rise and fall times. You're looking at this parameter here called rise overshoot. We have another parameter called fall overshoot here. Um, and this all occurs in a unit interval um, and, and, and you have jitter uh, on there. Actually, this is two unit intervals here, sorry. That's a, an incorrect diagram, that's, a, that's two unit intervals. A unit interval is the, the, the time of a single uh, bit uh, within the stream. So that's what somebody are looking to specify and they're looking to get a very, you know, they're looking to standardize across the industry and for us all to get um, quality signal sources that meet that specification. Now I've created this table which goes into a little bit more detail and uh, I'm sorry for all the numbers but I'll go in through it um, in a little bit of detail to make it clear. So 270 megabits per second is where the industry kind of started uh, with SD. Quite quickly we moved on to HD 1.485 gig then on to 3G at 2.97 and then later years with respect to UHD in particular we went on to 5.94 gigabits and now we're on 11.88 with 12 gig and this is getting you know, this is pretty popular and the humble uh, BNC connector has been the connector of choice all the way through 
And even 270 megabits SD, bits per second SDI was not what the BNC was designed for. So, so the, the basic infrastructure of coaxial with BNCs is being tested and is being stretched uh, pretty much to its limit, uh, especially with 12 gig. And that's kind of what we've experienced. Now, these standards, the SUMPTI standards, 259, 292, 424, 2821, and 2082, they're the ones that you should look at in order to get these figures um, included in this table. And the items in yellow, highlighted in yellow, are the items that SUMPTI want you to prove are correct for your source. If your source matches uh, this specification, uh, then it's highly likely that you'll have good on interoperability uh, with other products, and you'll have good performance uh, uh, in terms of cable length, et cetera. So amplitude is 800 millivolts plus minus 10%. I think we're all probably familiar with that. Uh, they do control DC offset. There are some SDI signals around the world with DC on them. Uh, that can cause problems with various measurement equipment, et cetera. But the specification is for it to be at naught plus minus 0.5. Uh, rise and fall times are controlled. In the early days, uh, we had a rise and fall time of uh, 1,500 peak seconds, so very slow for SDI. And there's also a spec for the minimum transition time as well. So those two are quite important if you want to have compatibility with, with, with SD interfaces. You need to have a greater than a certain rise time and less than another. The only one that actually has a, a greater than parameter. All the others are less than. And what you find these days is that all the products, if you're using a 12 gigabit, bit per second driver, for instance, you'll have a 45 per second or better rise and fall time, probably all the way down to HD. So it'll be better than 270, it'll probably be 45, it'll probably be identical all the way through. And then you have a delta figure between rise and fall time. Um, you have a rise and fall overshoot uh, specified as being 10%. Now the overshoot uh, comes into account where you, or at least it starts to fail, where you have input or output return loss issues, or issues with your quality of connector, uh, issues with your uh, designs of your products, etc. And you can create overshoot and undershoot uh, under those circumstances, and that can create a difficult environment for the interface. We have two measurements of uh, a jitter uh, that, 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 are, that are controlled. One of them is timing jitter, and one of them is known as alignment jitter. Now, these all look different. You know, it's 0.2 UI here, 1 UI, 2 UI, 4 UI, 8 UI. If you actually do the math and look at the number of picoseconds that this equates to, it's pretty much the same. So timing jitter is pretty much the same value in picoseconds uh, for, for all standards, SD all the way up to 12 gig. Uh, but it manifests differently because, you know, when we're talking about a high frequency signal, it, you, you, it's 8 UI, it's 8 unit intervals of the I uh, of a single data bit time, um, have have the frequency, have the number of UIs, have it again, have it, have it. So the timing jitter is pretty constant, <coughs> and the alignment jitter has been specified uh, differently for each of the of the standards. Um, it's generally 0.2 alignment jitter, but for for 3G, 6G, and 12G, it was modified to 0.3, but with a recommendation of 0.2. And we always work with 0.2. It's, it's achievable generally uh, with our designs, but you may come across products that don't, and you may have to back off to 0.3 in, in, in terms of measuring that. Um, <clears throat> and there is a, a frequency band over which the jitter is measured, and I've included it on this table. Um, there's something you've also uh, published, typical cable attenuation. Uh, expectations, should we say, at each of the different frequencies. Now, that has to be taken with, um, that is, it's possible to achieve these values, uh, but not all products will, and not all generation of device will. So although these numbers are, are quoted, uh, don't take them at face value. Uh, look at the equipment you've got, test it, and check what the performance is. Otherwise, you may be uh, straying into pretty stressful situations for your interface and that cliff edge, you may be approaching that cliff and you may not know about it. Um, and one thing I thought I'd uh, highlight here, which is quite interesting, I think, uh, if you have a 40 dB loss at 5.94 gigahertz, you've only actually got 1% of, of, your, of the voltage of your signal left. So if you started with 800 millivolts, you've only got eight millivolts of signal left. So you're now pretty, uh, subject to noise, et cetera. Um, and that, that interface is getting reasonably fragile, should we say. 
So the 40 dB loss, 1%. And I've included the percentages here. Right? That's actually a power indication, 40 dB. So 1% is a 20 dB voltage difference as opposed to power, but 1%. Um, so what advice I would get, uh, give here, I guess, is understand the performance capability of the products that you're connecting together and use the appropriate dB attenuation. Now that does equate to cable length, depending on the cable type, uh, but I would stick with dBs in terms of knowledge. Uh, so dB at 5.94 gigs, make sure that attenuation matches the performance of the parts that you're connecting together. And it's the endpoint you care about. The endpoint has to receive this. The transmission side has to match the spec. The receive side has to equalize, has, has to have an equalizer with the performance uh, indicated here. So those, that's the blueprint of quality for maintaining signal integrity uh, as, as provided by Sumpty across all these different standards. Um, there's another item that I think I should share, <clears throat> which is receiver tolerance to jitter. So we have the specifications of 2UI and, and 0.3UI for your timing jitter and your alignment jitter. Um, but in each of these specifications, there's far more detail uh, regarding jitter tolerance of input stages. Now we've created a special tool that allows you to work with this and allows you to create sinusoidal jitter and you can inject it into your test signals. So you can so you can exercise uh, this this is like an area under the graph under this curve. Uh, as you move up in jitter frequency, uh, you must be able to perform correctly with sinusoidal input jitter of these given amplitudes a1, a2, and then this 20 dB slope here. So if you were trying to test your interface fully and you wanted to type approve it, you would start down at low frequency and you would work your way along here uh, with, with an amplitude of A1. So that would be two UI of jitter, sinusoidal jitter inserted, and you'd, you'd work your way up the frequency response. And then you start attenuating a little bit, you get to A2, you'd carry on. Um, so that's actually in all the specifications. I've included some words here that, that describe that. Um, so you have these, the low frequency jitter tolerance band called A1 and the high frequency jitter tolerance band called A2. This is quite advanced, uh, not too many people going to testing this, but if you're a manufacturer, this is the sort of thing you ought to be doing. And if you may be a large consumer of kit, you, you may want to type approve uh, various products so you can understand um, their performance with respect to received jitter. If you want to know a little bit more about the subject, check out some TRP184. That's all about jitter in bits in, in, in digital systems as in specification. And if you want to look at the measurement techniques, that's all in, included in 192. And, and we, our products work according to part of 192. Uh, it has lots of aspects to that standard, uh, but we do as part of it uh, as required. So that's receiver tolerance to jitter. So this starts to explain to us, you know, after get the feeling people with 3G SDI, we sort of become lazy. You can, you can just plug stuff together and it sort of works. But obviously we now with 6G and 12G, mm. um, it's not that simple. Things are now, there's a lot going on, isn't there, Phil? There's a lot going on. And what's happening is the, you know, you may have had a chipset that worked brilliantly at say 3G or, or HD. When you buy a chipset that works at 12 gig, 6G gig, 3 gig HD and SD, you might find that some of the performances are not as good as you're used to uh, because the chip, you know, the chipsets compromise a little bit because it'll be optimized for the 12 gig side and, and you may get shorter distances at the lower frequencies. Uh, that's that's something for manufacturers to worry about. Uh, mm. But if you're buying equipment, these are just things that you need to, that, that you should be aware of, really. Yeah. <clears throat> so Steve briefly touched on the iPad. Do you want to dive in a bit deeper now? Because, you know, yeah. there is a lot going on here. And I've seen plenty of people where, you know, they've been concerned, but they don't probably fully understand what they're seeing. And they get the old chief engineer in. He takes a deep intake of breath and kind of, yeah, it'll still work. Okay. <laughs> what is that sharp intake of breath all about? <laughs> well, yes, also, okay. if I could, for just a second, you know, a lot of people also just don't realize, and we need to make sure to emphasize that the iPattern is just a transmitter test. 
It yeah. isn't yeah. a receiver or a cable test. Correct. Yeah. It's misunderstood by a lot of people. Yes. Um, we is. get lots of questions from people looking and they're saying, you know, the, the uh, rice time doesn't look good at 10 meters. And it's like, well, <laughs> it, won't look good. Well, it won't look good at 10 meters. So I think it's a complex subject. I think people do get confused by it. Um, yeah. So we're going to we're probably going to say this often, but the eye pattern measurement is at source. That, that's what you're supposed to do. Measure it at source. And you need to have a decent cable. Uh, we've of late started selling a cable that we've had specially manufactured. Um, this is specifically for 12 gig SDI because it, it's kind of, you know, the cable matters, the connectors matter, etc. Yeah. Um, and we get quite a few people confused about whether 800 millivolts is 800 millivolts or not. And uh, as you'll find out in a minute, there's quite a few reasons why it isn't 800 millivolts and quite often. So this is the cable, uh, the one meter cable that we provide. And this is the eye pattern display. Now, as we've already mentioned a number of times now, you, you make these measurements at the end of a one meter reference cable. Um, quite an inter interesting subject, this one meter reference cable, and it's caused us a lot of confusion. Uh, a few years ago now, actually. Um, but the SMTI specifications say that you must have 800 millivolts at the end of one meter of cable. But they don't say how good the one meter of cable should be. And <laughs> different uh, different versions, you know, different manufacturers of 12 gig cable. Uh, well, you know, the, the, those manufacturers will sell you a number of cables uh, that can operate at 12 gig. And they'll all have different attenuation figures, which will mean you'll get different measurement figures um, from your, from your, you know, from your testing, etc. So you need to be a little bit careful here. I'll come into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, but on this eye pattern, we've got automatic measurement of those sumpty parameters that I've highlighted. So we're looking at eye amplitude, we're looking at eye DC offset, we're looking at rise time and fall time and the delta between them. We're looking at rise and fall overshoot figures. And we're looking at timing and alignment jitter thermometers. And we've got on our products, it's, it's instant accurate readings. And we also have these H and V histograms here, which th these are looking at the, if you imagine all the pixels uh, stacked up, uh, in histogram form, that's what this is. It's looking at all the pixels being received. And you can see that this is pretty Gaussian in shape, um, which means this is a reasonably a reasonable distribution uh, of values. Now, Steve uh, highlighted how SDI is made up and th this is full of transitions from naught to one uh, and back again, uh, but it's got a pretty complex frequency component. And there are lots of methods of stressing that frequency component. We'll come up, come on to things like pathological signals later, but they stress the frequency component. And when you stress that, the eye pattern actually changes shape. As the eye pattern changes shape, these measurement algorithms uh, get, uh, get their own form of stress, shall we say, and sometimes products will start to measure incorrectly. So what I should say is we've made a few things, a few, there are a few parameters on here that make things easier to understand. So we draw this line, we draw the rise time line and we draw the fall time line. First of all, actually, we, we, we determine the, what we believe is the amplitude of the eye pattern. That's this bright the white line here is what the automatic measurement system has determined. And it's done it by using histograms uh, and a few, it, has, it actually has multiple histograms that it uses, but it's using histograms to, to detect that white line. And it's saying, this is what I believe is the most positive, not most positive, this is what I believe the eye amplitude to be, the top half. Another line saying where I believe the, the bottom point of the amplitude is. From that, I will draw an 80% and a 20% um, dotted line. And I will connect and, and I will make my rise and fall time measurements related to that 80% and 20% point. And it draws it on here. So at any time, you can see what the system's doing and you can see where it's determining its measurements. So here it's saying 30 peak seconds, 20, 28 peak seconds. It's determining that from these lines. If these lines were uh, drawn incorrectly, because maybe the eye pattern was too complex, you'll see that and you know then to ignore, to a certain extent, uh, these figures. But in this instance, this is a very clean eye and these are pretty accurate uh, measurements, I believe. You see signal amplitude is 799 millivolts. We actually have two curse, two lines. One is the positive excursion, which is 399. Negative is 400. 
and then we have a DC figure that we that, that we publish also. So these are all, to, all automatic measurements. The other thing I should mention is that we've currently got a high pass filter in place, which is one kilohertz. What that means is that you're not seeing any jitter on this waveform from below one kilohertz. This is this is a, a um, this is a, a high pass filter. So any jitter is not being shown. I can wind this down to 10 Hertz and then you would see 10 Hertz jitter included in this display and this would be bouncing backwards and forwards. But if you wanna get this clean so you can see what's going on, wind that up a little bit, get stability, observe it. But remember that's in place on here. We've also got a timing uh, um, jitter measurement uh, for 10 Hertz, which is showing 0.15. It would have to go all the way up to this red line here. There's a boundary here between green and red for it to be in danger area. So we're, we're very clean in that respect. And again, on the alignment jitter, it would have to go, this is the 0.2 UI where it's going from green to yellow and it's going from yellow to red at 0.3 UI. So again, this is a pretty good looking signal. In order to get this, we have a sampling front end on the oscilloscope and it's got better than 30 gigahertz analog bandwidth. Uh, so this is pretty expensive technology to work with. Um, and that's the fifth harmonic of six gig. And that's kind of what you need in order to do these things properly. So that's the eye pattern display. Um, I mentioned that, you know, you need a decent one meter cable, et cetera. And eye amplitude is difficult to measure. Uh, this is an indication of that. So these are uh, eye amplitude measure. Uh, I am, these are eye patterns, one and a half gig, three gig, six gig, 12 gig. You can see they're pretty damn clean when they're, when they're low frequency. The higher they get and the more uh, fuzzy this becomes. Um, so once you're up at 12 gig, uh, you're bringing in uh, you know, a little bit more fuzziness in there. Um, but you're looking for 800 millivolts plus or minus 10%. One thing I should point out is most SDI amplitude measurement equipment uh, in the broadcast industry is specified to plus or minus 10% accuracy. And if you're looking at scopes, they know better. So this this is a this is a and ten percent is the spec eight hundred plus or minus ten percent is the spec so the accuracy of a lot of kit is actually at that level um, I, I can say that ours are, are designed to be much more accurate than that but it's actually pretty hard to guarantee levels so if one piece of kit was at plus ten percent one was at minus you'd have a hundred and sixty millivolt reading different between the two pieces of equipment and both according to that spec would be in will be considered to be in specification. So just be a little bit careful about, about amplitude and, and understanding the uh, how well your equipment's performing uh, with respect to calibration. Even with really good quality 12 gig connectors, and we've had these discussions with all the manufacturers of, of BNCs, you'll still get about a 10 millivolt discrepancy on amplitude. And all you have to do is wiggle the connector. Uh, that they're spring-loaded, 12 uh, BNCs are spring-loaded, wiggling the connector, believe it or not, will give you something like a 10 millivolt discrepancy at each end. So when you're making accurate measurements, make sure you touch those connectors and just make sure they're, they're working consistently. Otherwise you could have up to a 20 millivolt error in your, in your measurement. Connectors age, we've had to put some really special 12 gig BNC connectors on, the, uh, on our product range. Uh, for 12 gig measurement. Uh, it uses a different alloy for the center pin. It costs us three to four times what it costs for a normal BNC. And what are we getting? We're, we're getting 2000 plus insertions. So if you're using our kit in a one-off install, you, you don't need that. But if you're using it to test and test and test again, uh, then you need really high quality connectors. So just be aware that connectors wear out. They wear out on your cables as well. So you need to be checking your cables from time to time if you're taking very accurate measurements. Um, Somebody specifies a one meter cable. As I mentioned earlier, they don't specify the quality of the one meter cable. Therefore, uh, you may have problems with calibration. At the QX range, we have a unique calibration feature, um, which allows you to calibrate the end of the cable, i.e. The, the bit that you plug into the QX itself. You can calibrate that for 800 millivolts and it will modify the driver amplitude to ensure 800 millivolts at the BNC endpoint. So that's something to be aware of that you can calibrate. Um, measurements can be affected by eye shape. Uh, so check that the um, product is actually measuring correctly, as I've mentioned already. And then calibration. 
Uh, many companies run yearly calibrations. We do a lot of that for people. Uh, if if this is a subject that's really important to you, uh, then consider um, getting them calibrated on a reasonably uh, kind of regular basis. I thought I'd make a, this this slide, which is just an indication of what happens with longer cables. So this is that lovely looking eye pattern that passes all the specs. Everything's in white here. We've got nice low jitter. Uh, we've got no CRC failures. So this is looking at all the CRCs for the data bits in the stream. We look at the, the um, there are two streams in a, in a typical STI. So you get C stream or Y stream, but you've also got a lot of ancillary data and that's all protected with its own CRCs. So we're checking all those and we rank, we, we wind that up into a, an error rate per second uh, and we, we tell you how long it's been good for. Um, so that's that's useful to check and it's the only real way to check that you're receiving the signal and you're receiving it perfectly uh, at the end of the cable. It's also worth checking out cable length. Uh, this one's working with a 1.3 dB uh, attenuation loss. Uh, the QX isn't so good at measuring short cables. It's the, the Macom chipsets are not able to um, discriminate at low cable lengths, but they get much better at long cable lengths. So we just give an indication that it's less than 20 meters. Uh, but we get, when you get into longer uh, cable lengths, it starts to matter. This is the same um, signal after just 10 meters. So this is 1694. It's actually a three gig specified cable, but it's good quality. I'm showing it here at 60 meters. So it, you know the performance at 12 gig can be very good. Uh, this is one with 3G SDI connectors, but you can see it's tailing off. The measurements showing that it's rise and fall time appear to be out of spec. Uh, the red in here, the signal amplitude appears to be out of spec. Well, it will be. It's 10 meters down the cable. You will get losses. You can only use the eye pattern accurately to measure one meter of cable. And that's, that, and that's how you should use it. Uh, the other thing I should point out is that the, the jitter measurements are still consistent and similar. The, the one that bounces around is the timing, but that's because it's very low frequency and it bounces anyway. So we're just catching different uh, bounces of that. The others are pretty stable and you'll see they're very similar, uh, whether you're working at one meter, 10 meters or 60 meters. So your jitter waveform should continue to give you an accurate reading as to how well the receiver is performing in terms of, uh, you know, how much jitter there is on the signal after equalization. So this can be used all the way through. Eye pattern only for one meter. Jitter can be used for longer cable lengths. You can always use your CRC analysis. So even at 60 meters, we're getting no errors whatsoever. So that's showing that you've got no errors. And that's with 33 dBs of attenuation. So our signal has become quite small. And, and you can see it here. There is no eye pattern. There's nothing to see. It's 60 meters, but it's performing perfectly. CRC analysis says it performs perfectly. Cable length is, is indicated there. Um, jitter looks good. So that signal is still good. So that's kind of proof that you should just use the eye pattern for short, sh short runs. So thanks, Phil. So now we're going to take a peek at uh, looking at analysis and, and looking at how we look at this in, in depth and what these filters are that you were talking about and how we can okay. observe different tool sets. This can be measured at source and or destination. And um, it's usually specified in unit intervals. Um, so here's jitter analysis for UHD. This is looking at a 12 gig SDI signal. In order to get something to compliance, then each of these uh, jitter sections uh, can be observed, but the two that matter are the timing jitter and the alignment jitter. And they're obviously specified. We show you each of the, of, of the decades. It'll become clear what they are shortly. Um, we also have a jitter histogram, which allows you to look at the, the distribution of jitter. This is looking very clean, and this is looking like a, a Gaussian sort of distribution. But if, there were, if this had different shapes, you would start to understand uh, that the jitter being inserted is, is not maybe not Gaussian, and maybe there's some other uh, signal source causing causing those problems. Um, this is, but what I should point out is when you're doing jitter measurements, beware. Um, so this jitter display has been derived by receiving the signal, re regenerating the clock, and in regenerating the clock, you're, you're subservient to the uh, something called the fractional bandwidth of the receiver. And the fractional bandwidth is limited, and that will become quite clear. 
Um, so this is looking at the uh, at why why will you get different measurements from different instruments? So this is looking at the jitter bandwidth for 12 gig. This is timing and alignment. Now, this is the frequency response of the filters in our products. And you can see we have a pretty fast runoff. Uh, down, this is the 10 Hertz filter. Um, some to specify that you have a better than a certain runoff performance here, um, rather than specifying it exactly. So different products may have a different cutoff rate uh, for this filter. If they do, then your low frequency timing jitter will be different between those products. It's not a parameter that really matters significantly, I don't believe, unless you've got ridiculous amounts of it. Um, but just be aware, you will get different readings. Uh, alignment jitter, this is uh, the roll off that's specified in the specification. Uh, it also specifies the, the passband bit, which is here. Now you can see how it's really flat. Now we know quite a few competing products are not flat. So they will produce gain, or attenuation of the jitter measured uh, in this part. So be aware that that, you know, that does create differences. According to specification, alignment should be measured all the way up to one tenth of the clock rate of the interface. Now, most products on the market can't do that. Most products are limited by the fractional bandwidth and you're seeing that here. So this is popping in at just, of, just it's probably about six or seven megahertz. So we're able to measure uh, from the lower cutoff frequencies, i.e. 10 hertz, 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, all the way up to about 6 or 7 meg. Some competing products do, do less than that. Um, I'm aware of that because we've, we've, we've run all sorts of tests. So this is pretty good uh, as it goes. Um, but just be aware, you're, you're, you're measuring <clears throat> only jitter from this stop this stop band section to up to this pass band. If you need to observe jitter that's beyond this frequency, it will be visible in the eye pattern. So you'll still see it in the eye pattern and you'll be able to see it from there. But it's just, it's just worth knowing that instruments will have different noise floors, different pass band filters, different cutoff rate rates, um, different upper measurement limits and different measure al measurement algorithms uh, and cal calibration methods. They tend to get for the for most parameters, they tend to give similar responses, and we get similar results to the competition. Uh, but just be aware there are differences between instruments and be aware of how, it, how it's measured. And as I, as I say, some of the high frequency stuff can be seen on here. So if there was a uh, high frequency jitter beyond the 10 meg level, you'd see it in here, uh, and we're not seeing very much here. So, so I think we're, we're clear on this particular signal. Lots of people ask us. Obviously, they've heard of this pathological test signal for SDI. What is it? What exactly is going on? Is, is, basically, is this the signal that should break your system or take you right to the edge? So pathological test signals for SDI. This is a subject quite a lot of people will understand um, uh, from, uh, from the SD and HD days. Uh, but it's got rather complicated when it moves on to uh, 6G and 12G testing. There's a really good paper. Can't recommend this enough. If you want to understand the subject, find this paper. It's Sumpty um, created it. it well, it's a Sumpty paper. Uh, David Brown and John Hudson are the, are, are, are the authors of it. Uh, John Hudson's a pretty famous character uh, within broadcast and has been heavily involved in a lot of the SDI interfacing. He worked for uh, Genom, uh, which became Semtech, and he's, he's one of the authors of this document. So I, I would strongly recommend reading this if you wish to go into pathological testing in detail. Um, I've just got a few points to make here, I guess, on, on top of that. Um, please note that normal pathological testing is only use, is only ratified by SUMPTI for SD, HD and 3G level A. It's not ratified for 3G level B, 6G and 12G. John Hudson was working on that and I was working with him on bringing our products to speed with the recommendations that were being put to Semte, but, but John uh, was made redundant from Semtech and he never, it was never published, Semte never published the pathological test signal situation. So, so there's quite a, quite a story starts to evolve uh, from, from here. The pathological signals are all because of something called scrambling. This is the scrambler. Um, and it, this, is, this, this is the video data. These are the single bits of the video data. And 
I won't go into the detail of it. It, it, it would take us too long to do that. But this scrambler uh, basically modifies the data. There's a scrambler here, and then there's a, a non-return to zero um, section here. That The whole point is to ensure that there are sufficient transitions in the data stream to recover a clock signal from received data, especially that data contains uh, some static data in, in much the way that uh, video images can. Uh, this ensures that it's randomized and that it's scrambled. And it also provides long-term DC balance uh, for the ones and, and ensures that you've got an even number of ones and noughts in the data stream. Uh, so this is all about getting the DC part correctly, uh, et cetera. So documents available from Sempte, I recommend reading it. This is some data that I've kind of taken from it, which I think are the main points take, taken from that document. Um, we have uh, two PLL type, sorry, two pathological types which break that algorithm. So the algorithm, I've got it here, the G1X, X9, X, X4 plus one, uh, plus the um, NRZI bit, it's got failure modes. It's got quite a lot of failure modes. And the two worst failure modes that have been identified are related to uh, PLL testing and related to um, cable equalization testing. So these are the what we now call the low frequency pathologicals. Now, this set of sequences on the interface can cause the scrambler to create this signal repeatedly, all the way from the beginning of the line right to the end. Won't do it always. It has a statistical chance of doing it once in every 512 lines. But when it happens, you get this sequence on the interface, which is really stressful for the interface. You can imagine trying to run a, run a cable equalizer with so little data. You've only got, the, you've only got these small pulses. Um, you can get the opposite of this with, with single pulses going downwards as well. Um, so that's one type of pathological, pretty stressful for the interface. Another type of pathological is the PLL test. Um, and this is one where you end up with a square wave. Um, so you've now got an interface, which although it's running at, uh, let's say, uh, three gigabit per second, um, 20 bits are high followed by 20 bits low, and it continuously does that. So that's pretty hard for getting your PLL to work. Uh, you really are stressing your PLL. Um, there are further tests, uh, further uh, failure modes identified in the document, something called pothole, potholing. As I said, I think we won't have time to go through that now, but potholing is, is something you need to, to, to worry about as well. So all these, all these tests can be checked for by just creating a test pattern with these, uh, with these particular uh, codes in them. And that's what we do. So that's done for, um, for SD, HD, 3G. When it came to uh, working with 3G level B, 6G and 12G, uh, it all got a lot more complicated. It got more complicated because it was a, it was a more difficult subject. The, uh, to create these signals, if you dig into the standards, uh, you take separate streams with all their own TRS words, et cetera. You multiplex them all together. This creates much bigger potholes, um, but it also means that you're very unlikely to get the same pathological conditions on the interface. And, and the chip manufacturers tried to fight that for quite a long time um, until they managed to get the chips to work. So, so there, are, there are some chips from many years back which may struggle with pathological signals, and you'll still get some that struggle today, especially optical interfaces, um, but some will work very well. So we created some unique um, features, and I should probably just say what they are. This is the proposal that, 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 that was being uh, put through Sumpte of a new type of pathological. It had the PLL check, the EQ check, their low frequency pathologicals. It had color bars, which is called a mid frequency pathological, and it had high frequency pathologicals, the clock pathologicals, and you can combine it all into a single test pattern. It's available on our products. And because the manufacturers were not happy to uh, create receivers that worked with full pathological signals, i.e. occurring the full length of the line, we uh, created the concept that you could insert as much of it as you wished. So you can see we've cut it off here. And this is probably looking at something like a 60 or 70% pathological rather than the 100% line. So you have that flexibility. You can work with that. Um, you're perfectly liberty to work with, say, a 25% pathological, and that would be that would be okay. You know, as long as you made people aware that's what you're doing, um, that's probably going to that's probably going to be okay for most people in, in, in terms of receiving signals. But that's a kind of a unique feature um, that we that we put together. Yeah, so Phil, you've got a whole series of 
stress tools that you have created that are very unique to fabrics. And what are you stressing? Are you stressing the transmitter? Are you suppressing the cable, the receiver? How do those stress tools exploring the limits of what we can do? We created an advanced stress tool set um, to go with the, uh, as, as an option for, for QX range. And a lot of it was to do with testing with Maycom and Semtech and TI. We worked with all those companies. We asked them what did they want and, and they uh, advised us as to what they would like. And we put a whole lot of tests together. These are quite advanced, so they're for more advanced testing. Uh, so normally you'll be looking at your eye pattern, you'll be looking at your jitter, and you'll just be checking that you meet spec, uh, et cetera, as, as, as per the rest of this document. But we have some uh, much more advanced tools. You can see here we're, we're inserting jitter sinusoidal at a, at a particular frequency. And you can see that the, um, well, you can see that here now. So in order to, one of the big subjects was, was, was eye amplitude measurement. Uh, for most people, the measurement tools we have in the standard products are fine. Uh, but if you're starting to work with oscilloscopes and other pieces of equipment, which are not SDI uh, based at the core, but you want to test the interfaces, then you'll come across something called Shorth mean. Um, so we have the ability in the advanced tool to use Shorth mean as a method of measuring eye amplitude. This is a windowed method that uses pixels within a particular rectangular window. You position it on the eye waveform according to where uh, uh, the, the best indication of eye amplitude will be. And it creates this, this it has the original histogram, but it has this new blue histogram, uh, which is the Shorth mean histogram. And you can use that as an alternative method for measurements. And as I say, this is when comparing to uh, alternative, more industry standard uh, pieces of equipment. Um, so that's just something to be aware of, pretty advanced. Um, we put a whole lot of tools in there um, for testing interfaces from the generator side. So normally you'd be generating HD, 3G, 6G, 12G. You'd want signals to be signal link, dual link or quad link. And you choose your test pattern and whether you've got pathological, etc. So you choose that, uh, but then you've got a whole lot of things that you can modify. You can play with something called sync bit uh, insertion. You can turn that on and off. You can play with the scrambler and turn that on and off. These are useful if you're, if you're an engineer working in a lab and you care about checking the timing of signals leaving your product. So that's quite, that's quite specialized. Uh, we created a PRBS generator. Uh, that was uh, through working with Maycom and Semtech. They do all the chip testing using PRBS initially. It's far more scientific and, and far quicker uh, to get uh, repeatable results. Um, so we created a PRBS generator, which replaces the SDI data, rather specialized, but allows you to use other pieces of kit. On top of that, optionally, you can do the jitter insertion all the way from one to 10 megs, all the way from 0.01 UI, right the way up to 128 UI. So an incredible tool there uh, that an, uh, allows you to create a signal, which is really stressful for a, for a channel. So you can begin to understand what the channel is doing. Uh, we can then modify the physical eye pattern itself. We can change the signal amplitude plus or minus 15%. Simply spec is plus or minus 10. So this gives you the ability to go beyond the spec and check that your receivers are working with uh, the full range of spec. You can play with rise time. You can play with pre-emphasis. You can mute it and you can do a signal invert. You can do all this um, using the REST API. So you can do it automatically, create your own test um, sequences, etc. Finally, you can insert bit errors into the stream. We have a pretty sophisticated bit error insertion tool, which, which will insert. Now that's really useful for testing the performance of kit and, and to see how well it behaves when there are bit errors on the interface. Some kit behaves really well, other kit doesn't. Uh, so that allows you to understand what's in your critical signal paths uh, and how well they're performing. So we have that tool set, uh, all, applic all applicable to the signal generator. And we have this path which allows you to monitor whether you've got pathological detection, uh, pathological conditions uh, on the interface. So this allows you to check that. Uh, this was all done with work with John Hudson and other interface experts. And it was all to, to help them uh, with their testing, but it helps manufacturers as well. Rather advanced, I won't go into any more detail uh, on that. Um, this is using that tool, um, but using the REST API, we've, I'm just showing you inserting 0.3 UI of jitter, and we've swept it all the way from 10 hertz, all the way up to uh, six mega, well, all the way, this is charting up to 10 megahertz. 
Um, and you can see these are the different filters. You can see them coming in. So you can see how it's filtering the jitter and it's giving you readings. So this is, this is proving to us uh, that our products are performing correctly and to spec. And we do this to, to help ourselves. However, if you were to insert a third party product <laughs> between the generator and the analyzer, you could look at the transfer function of your own products. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting tool set and you can drive everything under, under REST API. Um, we, with the PRBS tool set we created, we've also got a, a document, a white paper on that. You can download that. Uh, you can have a look at it in detail. And there's a whole lot of tools on the QX with the advanced uh, tool set that allows you to generate these PRBS sequences, analyze the PRBS sequences, et cetera. So just one thing I'd like to point out real fast before we wrap up with all that Phil has gone through, if you have noticed, it was all pretty much about the transmitter. Yeah, we're stressing the receiver a little bit, but it's primarily SDI and I tests are about the transmitter. We may need to do a complete another session on how do you look at cables? How do you look at receivers and what do receivers do? Well, so, the, the stress is the stressing on the generator is all about stressing the receiver. Yeah. So all, all those inserted stress signals will stress your receiver. So we are, we are stressing the performance of your receiver with that. Okay, great. Just, just um, but a lot of people want to check their cable. They want to check, make sure things yes. are good at the end of a cable. And, yes. um, you know, if you pop back up real quick to slide nine, if you would, Phil, <laughs> uh, looking at the CRCs is really what's going to tell you what's going on at the end of a cable as far as is your receiver possibly going to be able to receive it or not because yeah. as phil mentioned different receivers have different characteristics this is going to be looking at the receiver and looking at the crc errors of yeah. the qx if you have Which, a if you have a one thing to point out if you have a copy feed on the product you're receiving the signal with then you could probably test that copy feed in order yeah. to see in order to check these these parameters. If you haven't, you're right. You don't know how how good does the receiver perform, and um, and how does it tell you whether there are problems on the interface. It's not yeah. a piece of test kit, so it's probably not going to tell you a great deal. Yeah, and and a lot of the loop throughs are are taken down to basically, you know, a, a data stream and then re-encoded yeah. SDI. Well, so. Well, Yes. One thing I would say that would be quite clear. So here we're saying, you know, I'm receiving a signal with 33 dB. If you if you know your receivers can only deal with 30 dB, let's say, um, then you could put extra cable in line with our receiver uh, to make our receiver uh, perform at the 30 dB level. If you see what I mean, in in terms of you know, in terms of what it sees as as, as damage in here. So you could you could check um, whether a 30 dB reception should work yeah but but you're getting into a complicated area there yes so i always tell people if you want to know how close you are for your receiver that you're going into how far off the floor are you is to patch in a known length of cable at 12t yeah. you may want to drop it down to like five five meters maybe 10 meters and yes. patch yeah. that in with a true 75 ohm barrel and yeah. make sure your receiver stays up and your receiver is not taking errors. You at least know how much headroom you have. Without yeah. doing that, you may be a quarter of a dB off the floor. And like Phil said, aging, somebody taps the BNC and you just happen to lose that five or 10% of signal amplitude and the amplitude change your receiver could fall on its face. So yeah. it's yeah. a whole nother area of this that I know a lot of people want to be able to put their meter at the end and say, well, I want to look at the eye pattern at the end of the cable and see what it looks like. And it's like, well, right here, you can see it's much. It's mm. it's not discernible. And you, you're talking about fractions. You know, you're, you're talking about millivolts or fractions of millivolts at the end of the cable. So yes. um, just, I think just that's really wise. I think that's really wise. I think it's really wise to have a, a, 
as you say, a five or 10 meter cable with, with, and you can buy barrels that are 12 gig SDI specified if you wish. Yeah. So Cindy? Yeah, a couple of questions. Here, do you have a couple of questions for us? We do, we do. Ask this one, which signal conditioning processes can be used in order to compensate for any signal distortion in terms of eye pattern jitter? Oof. <laughs> You can, yeah, you know, and you can insert a reclocker partway down the cable. You, that's the, that's really your only option because once yes. the damage is done, the damage is done. So you need to avoid uh, that situation. And do so you shot, have shorter a... cable runs, better cables? <laughs> yeah, sorry. On that, no, that was that was all me. On that, then um, to to follow on, is there a preferred uh, BNC connector for twelve G? Yeah, each of the manufacturers has uh, has um, special 12G connectors, um, and there's a whole yeah there's a whole range of qualities of, of 12G. Yeah, you, you really need to make the cables and test them uh, just to make sure that they're, they're of the performance you expect. You also made the key point, Bill, about yes, if you plug it up once and leave it, but if you're rigging de-rigging all the time, you should be yeah. looking at connectors that have that number of guaranteed insertions because otherwise you know down the line you're going to be having issues um yeah, and again yeah. i think the, the challenge is we've got into this mentality from 3g one and a half g and 3g where it sort of just works yeah what i would say is um although it depends on your cable lens but you only really need the 12 gig, spe gig specified stuff for long for long runs if you if you're on short runs test it test it and check it you you probably find, you know, I my measurements were sixteen ninety four. That's not a twelve gig cable, but the cable works fine for sixty mm -hmm. meter runs and any distance in between. So you don't you don't necessarily need twelve gig cable. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but um, you you know, check the performance, check your requirements. Mm. Yeah. yeah one thing... question. So one question. I know we frequently get asked here, and I think we're seeing this with the introduction of. 1080, 50, and 60p that lots of people built facilities, but they're only running at one and a half G with they were future proofing it when they put this in. Now we're starting to see 1080, 50, and 60p with HDR on it because it's a very effective way to distribute it and that. And suddenly they're finding out maybe their system's not quite what they thought it was. Yeah. Also seeing a lot of questions about looking at cables, are they within spec? And the problem is Simpty doesn't spec that receiver. It says that it should work to, at, let's say for 12G, it says it should work out to 40 dB, but more or less is acceptable. So they just opened the can of whatever and said that, if you put it on, it works at your three meters. Technically, you've passed simply with your receiver. Yeah. Uh, there we, we is do no of, specification, no hard specification yeah. for any SDI receiver. It's the same exact paragraph from HD all the way up through uh, 12G that says it should work at XYZ dB a loss but more or less is acceptable. And that's why you need to do that headroom testing because every receiver is going to be different. It's chipsets, it's board design. Yeah. You know, we're dealing yeah. at 12G, we're dealing with a rise time, at least at the transmitter, we're dealing with a rise time that's in like the 35 gigahertz range. I mean, it's outrageous, yeah. the yeah. rise time of that pulse. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what we we find a lot as well. The not every piece of equipment has a reclocker uh, employs reclockers, <laughs> and the if you look at the there are quite a few routing switches that if you look at the signals coming out of them, they're dependent on the signal going in. Yeah. So depending on what you send in, you'll get something different out. So so it's that's not a static thing. You you really need to have a look at. You know, you need to check the quality of what you've got and design accordingly in your system. Um, yeah, the other, the other sorts of things you get, sometimes people use SDI drivers that are 
dual output. They might use one for copy feed and one to go into the switch, for instance. Um, if you don't terminate the copy, or if you terminate it and not terminate it, you will change the performance of the receiver because the, the, the signal leaving the receiver affects the performance of the receiver. So, so there's just subtleties like that that occur in systems. Um, I'm sure quite a lot of people have come, come across these things, but we've, we've seen things that have surprised us, to be honest. And it's only looking at the eye pattern uh, that'll show you uh, what's actually going on and checking jitter content on the output of that switch. So indeed, we've probably got time for a couple more real quick. A couple more? All right. I'm, I'm, there's so many good ones. So along those lines, Phil, you're talking about installations and, and design. We have someone asking that uh, when they're testing an installation, what should they be looking for in order to know uh, they're not too close to the edge of the cliff? DB loss, CRC errors, something else? So I think DB loss is, the, is, a, is a good one. Um, you, you can look at cable length, but the cable length measurement is determined by the quality of cable, et cetera. So cable length by itself is not a, is not a, is not a sign, but the D, DB loss is, is probably what you ought to look at. Just, just, just see what I was saying. Yeah, DB and loss that. and no CRC errors. And no, yeah, you, you, yeah. I'll because, be yeah, you, you gotta get your DB loss where within where your receiver is not taking errors. And do, and do what Steve says, you know, bring, make sure you've got a 10 meter cable with you and add it to the cable length, check that it still performs correctly. Then you've got some headroom. Yes. Throwing back to a couple of questions ago, and uh, Kevin, you mentioned about 1.5 um, gig. Somebody asked, hey, I found uh, with my router that I could make SD modules work for HD, but the eye patterns were all messed up and ended up looking like Celtic designs. Um, and they were able to, <laughs> to pass the 20 foot, um, uh, 20 feet of cable near the router. But can you speak to that? <laughs> it's surprising what works. I've seen all sorts of eye patterns that work that you, but it's it's not a it's not a guaranteed way of working and it's not a safe way of working. Uh, could, could, couldn't recommend that. Um, yeah. Most most yeah. likely that's reflections coming yeah. back from. Well, well, I'll tell you what you do get, which is interesting. Um, it's difficult to get things to work on long cables. It can be really difficult to get them work on really short cables, uh, because when you get a very short cable, uh, you've got almost no attenuation at the transmission or the reception side. So any poor return loss situations just bounce along the cable and bounce back again and bounce and they start affecting the receiver. So, so, so really short cables can be a problem uh, and long cables can be a problem. Depends how well the products are designed and, and how good your connectors are. Mm. Phil, can I throw, somebody during this has emailed me <clears throat> an eye pattern from an SXE and said, would you be prepared to have a look at it? Yeah, I've done, we've done that for lots of people, yeah. Very happy to. So let me just, just pop this one up here. Oh, what, so, what live? <laughs> I'm going to do this live. So right, this, yeah. this, okay. this yeah. has come in while we've been talking. Yeah. Um, so I've not had a chance to look at it yet. So that's quite typical. What you're seeing there. So we can see the... Yeah, that's quite typical that you get that. It's related to the frequency content of what you've got. So the, you've got, as you said on the histogram here, you've got kind of the two peaks. You've got like two not. peaks, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Different chipsets have a different kind of look and feel to them. Yeah. And like Phil said, it's it's almost looking like, you know, even an odd field type things and interlaced. I've seen create weird things like this, even. But uh, yeah, it's just the. I the think that my sending. feeling is that's probably going to work fine, is my guess. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Although I'll, obviously it's not perfect, but it's. Um... Yeah, gets gets more down to the uh, alignment jitter, and the alignment jitter looks gorgeous. Mm, yes. Thank you. We do have a question asking about the main difference between timing and alignment jitter. Okay. So time, timing jitter is, is low frequency and it's caused by your reference locking, et cetera. So it's really low stuff down at the 10 Hertz kind of levels. So it's a really low, 
it's low frequency jitter. Um, and it contains the alignment jitter as well. So, so the timing jitter is just a, a much wider um, area, should we say, uh, of jitter, right from down yeah. at 10 hertz all the way up. Whereas your alignment jitter is different for different specs, but the it's generally from 100 kilohertz um, upwards. It's generally so, 100 kilohertz upwards. So you're not seeing that that low frequency stuff is. So the, the reason it doesn't matter that you you have a when you do clock recovery, you have a phase lock loop, and you 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 lock to the source, and that phase lock loop, it has this 10 meg balance, so it can track it can track the jitter coming in, and by tracking it, it effectively removes it. So the signal reception doesn't see that jitter. It, 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 it's been tracked out. Um, so the alignment jitter is the higher frequency jitter, uh, which will really cause your interface to fail. Uh, so alignment jitter over 0.3 is a spec, but any, anyway, if you go 0 0.5, 0 0.6, you're, you're very unlikely to receive the signal if it gets to that sort of level. With timing jitter, you can have, I can put 128 UI of timing jitter in, You'll see no effect whatsoever on the on the errors received. You won't get any. But where it will start to manifest is if you try to make a composite video signal from it without using any other references, or you try to turn it into a video signal. That signal itself will contain that lower frequency jitter. So so you start to affect the quality of what leaves your D to A converter if it's not reclocked. That's that's the only time that it really matters, yeah. the, the timing. Oh, so, yeah, I, I always tell people that at 10 hertz, the PLL, like Phil said, can just track it and they just write, the PLL just writes with it at, you know, above 100 kilohertz and you get in that alignment. That's the stuff that's going to get into the, the clock recovery circuit of the phase yeah. lock loop. And if you want, start yeah, if you want, if you want to look at the, if you want to look at the performance of it, you select the, on the iWay form, select the 100 kilohertz filter, and it will show you the jitter that's there above that level. And, and, and if that looks good, you're probably all right. But it, whereas if you select the 10 hertz, you'll see the eye will vanish, it'll close, because the jitter will just be going mad, and it'll look like there's nothing to recover. But select 100 kilohertz, see if there is anything to recover. Usually there is, and usually the timing doesn't matter so much. <clears throat> If somebody wants to take a look at the um, I and Jitter a demo or something like that, is there a link or something on the website? Would that be in the link that we put in the chat for everybody for those resources, Phil, do you think? or We can I... definitely do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for folks who asked about a demo, we had a few people asking about that. We'll take care of you and set up an appointment. And now we've come to the end of our presentation. So I'd like to quickly summarize the areas that we've covered today. I pattern measurement is the measurement at the source. Jitter measurement applies at both the source and destination, and it allows you to understand how your equipment is operating as both a sender and a receiver. SMPTE only specifies pathological test signals for SD, HD, and 3G level A, and that's important to remember. 3G level B, 6G and 12G, there is no agreed SMPTE specification. When exploring the limits of your facility, use CRC checking and also know your installed equipment's reclockers, EQ and receiver performance. The Fabrics SDI stress testing toolset will allow you to test your facility and ensure that the operation all the equipment and infrastructure is guaranteed and will not give you any performance related issues. We've got a lot of questions. We will come back to you individually after this. I think we're going to wrap here. What do you think? Uh, so thank you for coming to How Close to the Cliff Are You When Your Eyes Are Closed? Phil, Kevin, Steve, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, and pleasure. thank you, everybody that joined. And we want to Thank you and we wish you everybody a great day, a great evening.